Okay. So, thank you very much uh, for coming. Last session before lunch. My name is Christian Schweder. I'm a principal software engineer working at Red Hat. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about monitoring your Swift cluster helps. So I'm working like for two and a half years now on Swift. Uh, I'm also one of the core members uh, since about a year now. And most, uh, most of the time I'm helping our customers and uh, partners with their Swift deployments and trying to, to commit the work upstream back uh, to the Swift community release. So um, let's get this talk started. So I've got all good things comes in threes, right? So this talk will be like um, separated in three parts. First, we are going to have a look at the Swift architecture because this is important. Um, you need to know what you want to monitor. So we are going to have a look what processes are running on your Swift cluster, um, what your Swift cluster consists of. Next is uh, some basic monitoring. So Swift is shipped with a few tools that are really helpful if you want to ensure that your Swift cluster runs uh, in a good shape and your data is stored in a durable way. And then we will continue with metrics. And uh, metrics are really interesting, especially um, if you face customer requests, because with metrics you can ensure that the quality that you deliver to your customers and your users is always in a good shape and that you can, well, detect bottlenecks early and so on. So, a short overview about Swift itself. So, Swift is an object storage. Um, that basically means you don't have a block device or a file system that you're mounting. Um, all your requests to the storage system is done using HTTP REST API calls. So that means basically a put or a get request with your data. And so for this, you need an URL, right? So your user has an URL. It wants to, the user wants to store a, a document, for example, and he sends a put request. And this put request is then sent to a specific URL made out of an account name, a container name, an object name. This is sent to the proxy server, and the proxy server, in this case, it's only one shown, but um, for larger Swift clusters, of course, you have a lot more proxy servers. Um, and the proxy server itself is like the gateway into your Swift cluster. So it accepts all the calls from the users um, that want to use your Swift cluster, and the proxy server itself then forwards these requests to some backend storage servers. If you're running Swift with uh, the default of three replicas, which, was, which is most likely, at least until Kilo, um, then the request will be split across multiple storage nodes. So the object is taken, and it's not only stored once at that time, but stored three times uh, on different storage nodes, on different disks, to ensure a high availability and durability of the data. So even if you're one of these servers fails then, or the disk is broken, or so on, um, you have very good, well, not a very good chance, but um, you, you can ensure that the data is still there. At the backend servers, there are a lot of processes running. So I have only shown a single server on each uh, node here, but there are multiple servers running. You have servers for the account databases, for the container databases, and object servers as well. And at the same time, you have also multiple replicators for all this uh, different kind of data you have auditors, and you have updaters running there. What are these uh, processes doing? Well, the replicators are ensuring that you have multiple copies across uh, your cluster of these objects. For, for example, let's take um, this disk here, has a copy of your object, and if, for example, the disk here fails, the replicator will take care of that later and create a new copy uh, on, a uh, on a replaced disk, for example. If you're running Kilo or later, we have a new feature called erasure coding. In that case, you don't have replicators, but you have a reconstructor that rebuilds the missing fragments um, from your objects. Then. There are more uh, processes running. Um, the auditors are ensuring that the data that you have stored in the past is still readable and that the data still equals the data that you stored well, one or two years ago or whenever. And it does this by reading the objects or the container databases and building a hash and comparing that hash to a previously, previously calculated hash. And in case there is a mismatch, um, this object, for example, will be moved away to a quarantine section and will be replaced later on by the replicators. So there are a lot of uh, things going on in the Swift cluster. Um, 
a lot of processes here. You have, of course, a lot of network traffic also, for example, from the replicators, from the proxy servers to the storage nodes, nodes and vice versa. So you need to monitor all this. Happily, Swift is quite resilient to errors. So even, for example, if, if a complete server fails here, your data is still accessible by the, from the user, which is really nice and uh, makes a very good solution. What you can also do is you can group multiple servers into different regions and zones. So for example, you can ensure that at least one copy is always stored, for example, in a different data center or in a different rack. And by doing this, you can ensure that you have a really, really high availability and durability of your data because even if one of the data centers burns down, um, you still have a copy somewhere else available. You can also tell the proxy server to store data in a specific region first. Called, uh, this is a feature called write affinity. So the proxy server might use a local server, local storage server, or prefer a local storage server first. And these servers that are then replicating data later on to other regions and zones. We will come to that uh, in a few minutes again. So let's talk a little bit about some basic monitoring. So what I always recommend is that you first start with your existing monitoring tools. Most likely, it's you already have a data center, right? So you have already some kind of monitoring systems in place. Nagios, Ikinga, maybe HP's OpenView. There are a lot of tools out there, and most customers have different tools and prefer their own set of tools. So I always recommend to start with them and do some basic monitoring, like is a server available, or do we have um, filling disk and stuff like that. Swift comes with a few tools um, included that make this a little bit simpler. So for example, if you want to know if all my services or servers are available, there's a health check middleware. And you can enable this health check middleware inside your servers in the pipeline. And if you query the server then uh, with a specific health check URL at the end, you will get a 200 OK later on in case the server is available, of course. Another tool that is really helpful is uh, Swift Drive Audit, uh, which passes your log files on your server for errors on your disks. And if there's an error on a disk, uh, it will unmount the disk and write another log entry. So why is it unmounting a disk? If the disk is unmounted, the servers and the replicators can avoid trying to store data on these disks and just use other disks as well. So they already know that there is something broken and uh, don't try to store data on these disks or retrieve data there. One of the really useful tools is called Swift Reckon. Swift Reckon, well, basically it consists of two parts. You have one part, it's a middleware inside your servers, and the other one is a command line interface. And this tool gathers some data, for example, from the replicators, from the auditors, from the updaters, and so on. And it's a, you can send a, a basic REST API request then to the servers, and it returns to you a JSON dictionary. For example, it says, OK, my latest replication run took 30 hours, or 20 minutes, or whatever, or it failed. You need to do this for all your servers. So that's, you, you need to configure a lot if you use your existing monitoring tools. So Swift Reckon simplifies this a little bit because Swift Reckon just passes your ring files and the ring file will tell them, okay, we have like 20 servers here at these IP addresses, these ports, and Swift Reckon queries all of these servers and tells you, okay, we have five servers here and two of them are down or one of them has a really long replication time and so on. The next one is a tool called Swift Dispersion Report. Um, Again, it consists of two parts. The first part is Swift Dispersion Populate. And what Swift Dispersion Populate does is that it stores containers and objects across your cluster. And later on, Swift Dispersion Report queries these um, objects and containers, but not using the proxy server, but directly talking to the storage servers. And not only querying one copy of your data, but multi all copies of your data. So Swift Dispersion Report is able to detect if there are replicas missing. Right. This happens from time to time. Um, for example, if you change the ring, um, in, in that case, for example, you add a new disk or you remove disk, change servers and so on, 
then it's a, a little bit of time, there will be only like two out of these replicas available, and Swift Dispersion Report reports it back to you. If you want to audit a specific account or container, there's also a tool available for this, and it basically lists all the uh, container data containers inside your account, as well as the objects, and it checks if these are available. Okay, so we have um, some basic checks available if Swift is running, but these, these da this data um, that Swift is running is not enough uh, to ensure that your customers are happy. Maybe your customers call you on a Sunday night and tell you, you know what my bandwidth uh, for the incoming right objects is like, one megabyte a second now, and uh, I'm not able to store any backups any longer because I, I will never finish. And in that case, you need some kind of metrics. You need metrics from the past because you probably want to compare the metrics from the past to your current metrics. And you want to have some metrics from now to see if there's a problem at the moment and where is the problem. So you start collecting metrics. And metrics are fine, um, but it is that we humans are not really good in analyzing metrics um, if we just view the numbers, right? I mean, from these numbers, you won't see that much. So maybe you see that on the right side there's a timestamp, probably on the left side it could be whatever it is, and you don't see anything obvious here on uh, using these metrics. So what we really want is not only the metrics itself, we want a visual, visualization of these metrics. And if you visualize your data, you see immediately, uh, for example, here are some spikes, Here's a spike uh, down there. Actually, this data comes from this region. But you immediately, immediately see that there is some problem, or maybe not a problem, but at least an occurrence in your cluster. And then you can start looking into this further. So how do I get this visualization? Well, Swift is able to send metrics to, uh, to a StatsD server. And StatsD is a project that was uh, developed by Etsy a while ago. It's a small, very small server that collects metrics, aggregates these metrics, and can do something else with these metrics. So what we are doing here is these metrics are then sent from StatsD to Graphite, and Graphite actually builds these nice graphs for you. Graphite itself consists of multiple parts. Uh, there is a, well, the tool that accepts these metrics from StatsD, for example. It's called Carbon Cache. There's, uh, there are some database files that are stored on the server uh, in a specific format. Um, it's called WhisperDB. WhisperDB is like a fixed size database with a kind of round robin data. Um, so you can store, for example, some very fine grained data for, for a short period of time and then tell Carbon Cache, okay, for the data two months ago, I'm not really interested in like seconds of resolutions. I may, maybe I'm only interested in like a five minute resolution or something similar to restrict the amount of data that I store in the long run. And then Graphite Web. Graphite Web actually retrieves the data from the WhisperDB files and allows you to visualize the data and build some graphs. There's another tool here, uh, CollectD. So CollectD is basically doing or collecting metrics that are not collected directly by Swift itself. So, for example, you can collect metrics like CPU usage or uh, memory usage, um, disk, um, the free space on your disk, and so on. There are a lot of plugins available in CollectD, uh, so you can um, collect a huge number of different metrics, whatever you are interested in. You can even write your own parsers and add them using these plugins, and this data gets then also sent to the Carbon Cache later on. One nice thing here is that the communication, for example, from, from the Swift object server, or the replicators, or any other Swift process, is done using UDP datagrams. That basically means if the StatsD instance is down for whatever reason, that you're not blocking Swift, and you're not blocking the operations that your users are doing. Of course, you are losing metrics then, because you can't collect them anymore, but at least the Swift cluster itself is still working without any interruption, even if there's a backend for, uh, to, to store these metrics not available. 
Also, if you have a lot of uh, servers, you can scale that out so you don't only have a single StatsD instance, but multiple, and they aggregate the data then later on. So, installation and configuration of these tools. Um, in the past, it was a little bit difficult, actually. Uh, so, especially StatsD. StatsD is in, written in Node.js, so you have a lot of dependence here, dependencies here. Graphite itself is written as a Django application, so you have more dependencies there. And it was a little bit cumbersome, at least. Um, so, I'm with Red Hat, so we have a community distribution called Fedora. And actually, in Fedora 21, it, everything that you need is packaged already for you. So you only need to install these packages on the left side, and you have everything you need to, to uh, run Graphite and the StatsD instance, which makes it really simple to start building and playing around with it and to see if, if this is something that you might like and that you might add to your data center. So the first four tools, StatsD, Python, Carbon, Graphite, Web, uh, are only run on this instance, not on your Swift class, on, on your Swift nodes. Only Collect D will should be run on the Swift nodes because you want to store and you retrieve data from the Swift nodes itself. There are a few configuration files. So in Swift itself, it's a proxy server, account server, object server, and container server configuration file. There is an example in the configuration file. It's Basically, just telling Swift, okay, you have a StatsD server somewhere at this IP address, send the data there. There are two or three more settings. One is a prefix. Uh, the prefix is quite uh, useful because I always uh, tell our customers, okay, if you're using the prefix, for example, use, um, use a storage, uh, use a node name, because then you can later on um, see the metrics from different hosts and separate them. Otherwise, you have a huge set of metrics, but you can't see from which hosts they are coming from. For CollectD, it's uh, also quite simple. You enable a plugin that basically uh, allows you to send the data to Graphite. For StatsD, it's the same. You tell StatsD, StatsD, okay, here's my Graphite instance, send the data there. And then there are two more files, uh, storage uh, schemas conf and storage aggregation conf in, to configure Carbone. You really should have a look here. And because Carbon aggregates data later on and stores data for some specific time, for some specific period. So what does that mean? Um, let's have a look at a very simple example. Let's assume you have a 10 second period and you are collecting two metrics. And the one metric is always the same level, it's always a seven, so that's the green one here. And the other one is a well, red or orange one here. Um, that is a different metric. By default, all your metrics are averaged, and that does mean, in this case, that both metrics have the same average value, right? I have uh, 21 for three samples for the red one, and five times seven for the green one. The average is the same, it's seven. So if you just calculate the average of this data, that's not really useful to you. For example, if you're interested in the amount of replicated partitions in your Swift cluster, it doesn't matter if it's seven uh, for, for one uh, run, or maybe there are 10,000 runs with a seven, but you can't see it later on anymore. So you need to, to take care of the aggregation method. And in this case, for, for example, for the partitions, or for any counted values, you want to summarize the data, because the green value here, if you summarize that up, it makes a 35, and the red one only a 21. There's a huge difference here. Also, if you're running a little bit older versions of StatsD and Graphite, you are only collecting the la latest sample. And if, for example, Graphite is, uh, is configured to um, have a retention period of 20 seconds and you send um, samples every five seconds, only the latest sample is recognized by Gra or stored at the end. So you have to make sure that the retention period is shorter than the amount of periods that you're sending data into this. Okay, so hopefully um, you have then a Graphite web installation up and running. And if you have it up and running, uh, you're opening your web browser. And this is what it might look like. So you have on the left side a lot of different metrics. And in this case, I used a, a prefix to my storage, uh, my node names as prefixes. 
So I have multiple storage servers here, as you can see. And below this, you have a subtree with all the Swift processes that are running here. You can simply select a metric here then, and it will show up as a graph on the, on the right side. And what you can do then is you can apply, for example, transformations to these metrics. So in this case, it's a moving average over the last 10 samples. There are a lot more. There is a very extensive documentation available. And um, this tool is really handy if you want to play around with it and uh, see what, what kind of data you can get out of it. What is even more useful then, if you have an idea what kind of metrics you want to store, is a tool or is, is a part called the dashboard. And with the dashboard, you can arrange multiple graphs in a single page. And not even that, you can also merge multiple graphs into a single graph. So, for example, you are interested in the, in the number of quarantine containers, let's say, from different storage nodes. So you can just drop, drag and drop these uh, graphs on top of each other and then uh, create a graphs where you have multiple lines in a single graph or multiple metrics. There's also a small editor included in this uh, in graphite and it's basically a JSON dictionary that you have here. That's, that's the configuration of the dashboard. This makes it really handy if you want to exchange dashboards, maybe with your colleagues or you want to store the configuration in a repository or whatever else. If you look into the source code of this tool, you can even just uh, send the data using put and get requests using curl, for example, and have this uh, lying around as files. You also can store multiple dashboards, and um, this is, I think this is really useful because by default I create dashboards with a general overview, for example, then with an overview about some storage servers, the proxy servers, and even more uh, dashboards, for example, then down to each of the single servers in my cluster. And doing this, you have all of your data quickly available later on because if you face any problems later on, uh, you don't want to start to build dashboards at that time point. You want to do that probably in advance. So, that said, uh, let's have a look at a few selected metrics. So first, uh, we have the proxy traffic here. And let's say, as you can see, in the lower left uh, corner, you have get and put requests here. Uh, the same on the right side. Um, these are aggregated values and uh, as you look at the, on the scale on the left side, these are megabytes per second. And um, so the red line and the pink line here, these are your, this is your traffic. And here are some milliseconds, which is the response time to the user uh, on the proxy server. It's quite stable, so the data is not fluctuating very much. What you can see here is a light increase in the response time at the beginning of the, uh, of the graph, but it's, it's stabled out at the end, so it's quite stable at this area. Um, in this case, it was because um, there was some replication still running, um, heavy replication for a lot of smaller objects, and one of the, or multiple servers were a little bit busy, so, um, no, the servers were busy at this, at this area, not that busy at that area, so the response time was higher here. What you're probably interested in is the amount of errors that your users are facing and seeing. Most likely these are 404 errors um, because your users are like, or maybe an application is using or trying to access an object or a container or whatever that is not accessible or not available at the moment. Um, what you might look out for are errors like 500 errors or with a beginning with a five because these are, these might at least um, be a problem um, on your cluster. Uh, if you see a lot of uh, 500 errors and uh, Ramping up, or ramping up 500 errors, you want to have a look at these errors as well. Here we have an average uh, CPU usage on one storage node. And as you can see here, there's a well, kind of periodic interval. So we have at a time of 6.05 and then later on at 6.35 again, an increase in the CPU usage. In this case, uh, the storage servers were configured to replicate or to start replication processes every 30 minutes. So 
when the replication process hits in and starts, there's a lot more um, traffic or a lot more CPU usage uh, going on on your servers, and that's why the, why the load is increased here. What you want to look out for is, in this case, the red line. So the red line is the CPU waiting time. Um, as a general sum of rule, I, I think if it's a single digit value, like below 10, that's okay, that's normal. If it's increasing a lot and you have a lot of CPU usage time, it's mostly because your container database servers are, are somehow overloaded um, because you're probably running as a container databases on spinning disks, not on SSDs. That's a problem. So you want to avoid a high CPU wait time here. And if you have a high CPU wait time, you should definitely have a look why, why is it go, or what is going on on the, on the nodes then. Okay, so the cluster I used for this is a little bit smaller. So um, you can see here the free disk space on uh, a few selected nodes. And as you can see here on the left, um, on the left area of the, of the graph, you, there are three disks. <laughs> and the free disk space is quite low actually here. So I added more disks to this, to this small cluster. So first, a new disk here. And what you can see here is that the replication hits in. So the existing disks um, are increasing, or the, the free disk space is increasing on, on these disks. And as you ex can expect, um, the, the new disk is using more space here. So that's fine. That is what you would expect. But then there was another disk added, right? The brown line here. So you would expect that all the other lines are going up as well. This doesn't happen here. So if you look at this line, the new disk was added, and then the usage on this disk even dropped even more. This was, the reason for this was that the ring was changed, or a different um, uh, storage server on the ring was changed there as well. So you had multiple partitions moving at the same time. You applied it at the same time. And only after a while, uh, the free disk space on this disk also increased on. So probably you want to avoid operations like this where you, where you apply multiple operations on a ring and um, run them at the same time. <coughs> so talking about replications, um, these, is, these are the numbers of replicated partitions on a cluster. So as you can see here, it's quite periodic. Let's uh, take the green one here. It's running for some time and then stopping, and then 30 minutes later it starts again, running for some time, and so on. Uh, same for the brown one, and for this one, for the red one, and so on. What is interesting here is that the blue line, it's, it's running uh, much faster, only, a, well, maybe a minute or maybe 30 seconds or so. And so it's, it looks like a very high peak. So the reason for this is that this cluster was configured to use write affinity. What does it mean? The proxy server sent data, new incoming data to all other storage nodes. These other storage nodes store the data, and later on, at least one copy of the data from the other storage nodes is then replicated back to storage server number one. So storage server number one is not replicating any data back to all the other nodes, but the other nodes are always storing or replicating data back to storage server number one. And this is what you can see here. So sometimes it's happening that your storage servers are busy, which is normal. And in that case, a proxy server, for example, selects another node. In that case, these are so-called handoff nodes. And you see handoff requests. That you're Seeing handoff requests is quite normal. What um, you should look out for is spikes like these. So in this case, it's quite easy to, at least on smaller clusters, to, um, to, to, to do something like this. If you, um, for example, if you're storing a lot of zero byte sized objects and uh, your container databases are stored on disks. Because in that case, the storage, the object servers don't have to do or don't have much to do then but your container servers need to update a lot of small objects and a lot of small entries. And then they might get stuck, and uh, you see an increase in the handoff requests. So at the same time, you have so-called async pending files appearing on your cluster. Async pending files 
It's basically when the object server wants to store or wants to update a container database entry, and the container database is currently locked because another process is also updating the same container database. So the object server stores an async pending file, which is later on catched up by an updater, and then this, well, not yet done update will apply to the container database. So if you have a smaller cluster and you're sending a lot of zero byte sized objects at the same time, then you will see that the async pending files are increasing a lot, which is okay at that time point. What, what should happen then is that the amount of async pending files laying around on your disks is dropping again later on. So you, you shouldn't see that this li these lines are increasing all the time. If they're somewhat stable, it's okay but um, you, you always want to see that they are either stable or going down again later on. So, and of course you don't want to look um, at, at all these graphs at a single time. You want to build yourself some dashboards. So this is a dashboard that I used uh, in the past as a general entry point. Uh, so you have some, some basic overview what is going on in your cluster. So I was interested in, in the average CPU usage. And as you can see here, uh, the waiting time is a little bit increasing, um, which should be avoided there. Uh, I'm always interested in the proxy traffic, because uh, if the proxy traffic has some, some drops or some uh, um, heavy spikes in it, then I know either one of the users is doing something that is not done in the past, probably, or something else is going on there, or if it's uh, dropping a lot, Maybe there's an issue with the network connectivity then. The proxy timing here in this case is also interesting, so I put that onto the overview, as well as some other value, uh, metrics like the free disk space or error rates and so on. Okay, so I think I'm done for now. Um, what I'm doing is I will upload the slides to, to the website and at the end of the slides there are some example configuration files. So I don't want it to go into detail right now during the talk, but um, you see a few configuration examples that you need to um, build your own Graphite instance uh, so that you can start doing this. So thank you very much and if you have any questions, please feel free to, do, feel free to ask. And please use the mic. <laughs> No, Clay, you are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so I do have one question. When you were um, you, you were sketching out the, the block diagrams of where you had the StatsD and the, the carbon yes. cache and yes. all of that kind of stuff, how do you deploy that? Are you doing a centralized uh, StatsD listener, or do you do that on local machines and then kind of coordinate across that? Or what does that look like when you've got, uh, what's your pattern for doing that? Well, it really depends on the size of the cluster. I mean, why? <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't why? know that. Um, <laughs> because if you have a lot of requests coming in, uh, StatsD requests, you probably want to have multiple StatsD instances running, right? Um, what I did in the past is to, to separate these StatsD and Graphite servers onto separate machines completely. So they don't have to do anything with the storage or proxy server nodes. They were running on separate bare metal machines to have enough performance running there. Um, the last time I did this, it was only one machine, but it was a very beefy machine, but so it was fine. I mean, like, what, what kind of ratio do you look for? Sorry? Like one machine per 10 storage nodes, or? No, it was like 24. Okay. 24, yeah. So what you can do, uh, actually, is you can tell Swift not to send a metric on every, in, on every um, request, for example. You can uh, tell Swift in the configuration file, okay, I only want to have a metric sent out for every tens request, for example, and to lower the amount of incoming metrics to StatsD, for example. Um, yeah, so we also use StatsD for metrics collection. And, um, well, I mean, obviously we use StatsD for the emission and, and Graphite yeah. for the collection, but yeah. we don't use the uh, Graphite dashboards directly. You alluded to that it has that uh, API and you can collect the yeah. data metrics exactly. and then put them into different kinds of, different tools yeah. to organize your graphs. Um, but I think uh, for somebody getting started uh, with uh, Swift or uh, we don't, we say you should do 
at StatsD and Graphite, but we don't necessarily like have anything that we can turn off as a starting turnover as a starting point. And I don't really know much about the Graphite ecosystem. And I was wondering if you is there any way that as a community we could collaborate on some of these dashboards and share graphs? Perfect. Is there a chef cookbook for Swift that would include you know the base set of graphs to get you started? And then even if you decide to layer something on top of that, that's you know not just the Graphite draft boards, but something that's presenting them to your operations team or something. Do you, have, do you think that might work? Could that? Be the yes, thing? definitely. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's a really good idea. And I was thinking about the same uh, for one of the Friday sessions and to talk a little bit about this. Um, so it's even simpler um, because uh, the configuration for the dashboards you can exchange them like in a JSON dictionary, which is really easy. It's easy to read. It's easy to to ship and to store somewhere else. And yeah, we should definitely look that, into this. I think. So what Clay just said also is. If you don't want to use the Graphite dashboard, you can use uh, you can each of these small graphs that you see is basically an URL. So if you have a web page for, for your internal monitoring, you can also embed these graphs there if you want to. Any other questions? Clay has a one more, I think. Oh well, do you, know, do you know if any other projects are, are doing that? Do like, does, is, can I go if I'm running Nova? Does anybody have like, hey man, you should check out the Nova Graphite thing over here to get started? I don't know about the other projects. Does anybody um, else know internally? I'll reply to that one. All right. Uh, so um, at Catalyst, we are using um, Graphite and also Grafana as our dashboards, yeah. and we've published on GitHub um, sample dashboards for Ceph based on the. Yeah. Um, pretty much the same architecture, same structure, collecty. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely possible, achievable, and we would be very happy to collaborate with other people on doing the same with Swift because we are implementing Swift for object storage. So, awesome. Yeah. Sounds what, great. The, uh, um, I can tell you the. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. <laughs> Could you? Okay. We also using the ELK search for log. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So, and I like the idea to share all those things, because using those kind of assets about your query, how you have every data is very important that you can share. Yeah. So just to repeat this uh, for the mic, um, so the idea was that we have more and more data. We have Kibana data, or you have Kibana data, you have Graphite data, and so on. And to to really collaborate collaborate on the in the community to exchange a common set of dashboards. Um, because everybody probably uh, wants to run a, kind of some kind of dashboards and to have a good starting point um, for, for, your, for your metrics that you are collecting because a lot of time we're doing the same work probably. Yeah, please. Could, could you plus the mic? That would be great. So with your stats, do you ever look at trends and history and uh, do anything with that? Yes. Uh, so personally, I do. Uh, I didn't go into detail in this talk. Um, but yes, you can. There are some tools in, in Graphite included uh, to monitor trends. For example, if, what, what, if you look at a, at a let's, let's look at, for example, at this line. Um, it's, it looks quite stable, right? But in the long run, it might be that one week ago, uh, it was not 80 megabytes a second, but maybe, maybe only 60. And next week, it's 100. So you don't see that if you just look at a very short time frame. But this is the reason why normally I use um, um, trends and add them as well, so that I can see, OK, in the long run, it's probably going up or it's going down. Where it really comes in handy is the free disk space, because then you can somehow predict when your disks are running out of space so they know, OK, I need to order new disks within the next six weeks or so. So that's where it's really he helpful. And of course, well, a lot of more met metrics as well. So with, with this graphite, it's, it's only graphs. Um, but what you can do is, because 
all of the data for these graphs are coming as a JSON dictionary, you can just fetch the data and then parse the data in other external tools if you want to. Yeah, for example. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sridhar. I work for a company called Vedams. We use the StatsD metrics to collect it, plus do some machine learning algorithms on those, okay. and try to figure out if you know maybe some services are down, um, your disks are bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a self-healing system, so it, it's automatically going to go in. You know, the system is going to work, but maybe with a with a less performance kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if an IT admin is interested in figuring out, I want to know right away. Services are bad, they've failed, uh, disks are bad. So we try to use StatsD to, to kind of figure out predict if some, okay. some hardware is bad or services are bad. Uh -huh. And that we have open sourced. Uh, it's in GitHub. It's called Tulsi, T-U-L-S-I. Okay. So if people are interested to take a look at it, you know, can just cool. go that. Thank you. Uh, hello, it's a bit related uh, to this project, I think. Do you have some kind of tool to alert when uh, something strange happens? I mean, if uh, 500 errors increase uh, suddenly? Uh, no, um, at least not a tool that is available on some, some of my wrappers. Um, but what I'm normally doing is, if you have existing uh, monitoring systems in your data center, that we build like scripts around it or configurations that alert, send alert to someone if, for example, there are more than 10 or 100, 500 errors in the last minute or so that, that, you can, that you get a notice, okay, something really bad is going on here right now. But it's not included by default. Any more questions? How, how have you found the, um, the graphite uh, language, the, um, the, the filters and expressions? Um, uh, you, know, you can, like, so for example, uh, you have one on disk free. Um, that graph gets cumbersome uh, in, for example, like Donna's cluster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and so, like, one of the things that we try to do is, is you know, apply some filters to sort of wrap some yeah. stuff up. So, like, on this storage node, this is the aggregate storage, but then here's also a line that shows you the uh, most full disk, so you can watch, you know. Exactly. You don't, you don't have to have 6,000 lines. You can no, limit definitely it maybe not. down just to 100 nodes. Yeah. And then so, um, f especially for disks, uh, which is a good example, I think, there are some uh, filters like uh, show me only the top, topmost metrics or the lowest metrics. So, if you have, for example, disks and um, you have, let's say, well, 8,000 disks in your cluster, you maybe are only interested in the lowest 20 disks uh, that are running out of disk space right now and something like that. Or you might even want to group these metrics into different regions or zones that you know, okay, in this rack, I have three disks running out of space and that rack is, is fine and the next, uh, the third rack is like completely full or whatever. Sometimes throwing out information so you can get down to the... Yeah, so it can be overwhelming at the beginning, I uh, fully agree, but uh, I think you get used to it, especially if you use uh, through the documentation and uh, if you notice that you can apply multiple operations onto the same metrics, you need to play a little bit around with it, definitely. Just you you like did this all the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean. you know what, but it's so, it really feels like we could collaborate on yeah, it. Like some of the graph that I've had to string together to get yeah, to show yeah, what yeah. I wanted. Um, is, which I'm sure you guys are all smarter than this. You probably have better jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's, idea. Yeah. that's all right. Christian's talk next that in Tokyo will be on Grafana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Yeah, thank you.